Welcome to a most exciting evening with our presentation entitled Adam's Mother's Birthday. This is Dimensions of Prophecy with Kenneth Cox. I'm Brenda Wood. Perhaps you're saying to yourself, I didn't know Adam had a mother. Well, tonight, Pastor Cox will tell you who Adam's mother really was. This is a very important subject because it deals with a topic that is very, very misunderstood. Few have taken time to look at the real importance of it. But it is a question that Christian men and women need to be looking at and asking themselves about their relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ in relation to this subject. Let's not wait another moment, but go immediately to the meeting in progress as Kenneth Cox tells us about Adam's mother's birthday. I feel a little more comfortable. <laughs> we appreciate you being here, and you do look very, very nice, really. You ought to wear red more often. You're very, very beautiful. Appreciate that very much. As a boy of nine years of age, we moved from Chicago, Illinois, to Oklahoma. Moved out on the farm and hadn't been living on the farm very long until my father one day told me, he said, I want you to go with me. Uh, I'm going to take you out and show you or teach you how to build fence. And he took me out into the pasture and he selected a spot and said, this is where we're going to put the corner post for the fence. And I can remember that he introduced me to something called post hole diggers, which I wished I'd never found out what they were. But we dug this hole right there, and I remember we put the post in, and then my father and I tamped the post very well and made sure it was in real well, and then I remember he braced it, and he told me that that corner post would hold a lot of the weight of the fence, and it had to be put in very well. And then after we put that one in, I can remember that my father took the post hole diggers and he stepped off five paces. And after he stepped off five paces, he dug a hole and we put in another post. And then he stepped off five more and put in another post. And then he said to me, he said, now I'm going to show you how to keep your fence straight. And he took those post hole diggers and he stepped off five paces and stuck those post hole diggers in the ground and then he just backed off and he lined up those post hole diggers with those other posts in the corner post. When he got the post hole diggers all lined up, he dug the hole there. And he said, as long as you line that up, you'll have a straight fence. And I really found out that that was true. And I thought that was pretty good information to learn about putting in a fence. When I got older, I found out that that same principle was true in understanding Scripture. Exactly the same thing was true. You see, because it doesn't make any difference, I can put a post in here, and I could look at a post from this angle, and I might see it one way. You might look at it from this angle, and you see it another way. And somebody else might look at it from this angle and see it another way. And a lot of people do that with God's Word. But you see, if you take the Scripture and you find out everything that Moses said about a subject, and you find out everything that Isaiah said about that subject, and you find out what Matthew said about it, and what Paul said about it, and you line all that up with the chief corner post, Jesus Christ, you'll only come out one way. That will always work. And people that want to know what does God's Word say on any given subject, if you line it all the way up, you'll understand it. And tonight, we're going to take a look at a very important subject this evening. And we're going to take a look at the question of worship. And I told you the other night that your ability to worship is the most prized possession that you have. It's worth more than your life. It's worth more than your money. Is your ability to worship. And God has a lot to say about that. Now, our subject tonight is Adam's mother's birthday. And I told you I would tell you who Adam's mother was. And I'm going to, but I'm not going to till the end. So I don't want you all sitting there thinking that I forgot, because I haven't. Okay? 
but I'm going to tell you who it is, but it fits better at the end than it does at the beginning, okay? So I will be telling you, but we're going to take a look at worship, and we're going to put up some posts, and the first post that we're going to put up is found over here in Revelation, the first chapter in verse 10. Simple text that says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet. This text says that John was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Now, there are people that would read that text and say, well, if John was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, that means he was in the Spirit on the first day of the week. There's other people that will read that text and say, oh, if John was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, then he must be in the Spirit on the Sabbath. There's other people that say, oh, John was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, that means that he was having a vision about the coming of the Lord. You see, you can look at that several ways. That text doesn't tell me which day is the Lord's day. That text just simply tells me that the Lord has a day, right? So that text by itself is not enough. I've got to put up another one. I've got to put up another post. And when I put up another post, we go over here to Mark 2, verse 27, and he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath, Therefore, the Son of Man, that's referring to Jesus Christ, is also Lord of the Sabbath. Now, when I put this post up, this tells me that the Lord has a day. This one doesn't tell me which day is the Sabbath. It just tells me that Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath, right? Yes, it says that Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. So this one tells me the Lord has a day. This one tells me that Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath, so I need another post. So we'll go over here to the book of Hebrews, the fourth chapter in verse 4, and it says, For he spoke in a certain place of the seventh day in this way, and God rested the seventh day from all his works. Now, this text tells me that God rested on what day? Seventh day. Don't read something in that text that doesn't say. Because that text just tells you that he rested on the seventh day. It doesn't tell you whether the seventh day is the Sabbath. It says he rested the seventh day. So now, this text tells me that the Lord has a day. This one tells me that Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. This one tells me God rested the seventh day. So I need another post. Okay? So we go over here to Exodus 20, verse 8. It says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now listen carefully as it puts it all together. Verse 11. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed thee, what? Sabbath day and hallowed it. Now, this one tells me that the Lord has a day. This tells me that Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. This says that the Lord rested on the seventh day. And this one tells me the seventh day is the Sabbath. You see what I'm talking about? The scripture, you can line it up, dear friends, and if you line it up with that corner post, it'll come out only one way all the time. But for it, people will say, but Brother Cox, maybe the Lord changed it. Maybe God changed the Sabbath. Maybe he changed his law. Well, we need to look at it and see if he did. You remember, the scripture says that way back in the beginning that God made the light and the darkness, divided the firmament, and then it says that he created the sun and the moon and the stars, the grass, the trees, the fish and the fowls, and then he created animals and man, and it says he looked out over his creation and said, Lo, it is very good. You remember that? Now, I'm going to share something with you tonight. Something that when I gave my heart to Jesus Christ and I picked up the Bible and I began to read it, that did more for me to understand this book than any other thing that I've ever found in God's Word. And I'll assure you, if you can discover this one thing, it'll make all the difference in the world to your understanding of God's Word. And that is that as I begin to study the Scripture, 
I found out that this book teaches clearly that it was Jesus Christ that created this world. The Lord Jesus Christ created this world. I want you to listen to some text. God, who at various times and in different ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, listen carefully, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. It says that it was Jesus Christ that made the worlds. He's the one that created it, that it was made by his hand. Now, that doesn't mean that God the Father wasn't there. That doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit wasn't there. It says, let us create man in our image. They were all there, but the Scripture says that the Lord Jesus Christ was the principal agent in creating this world. Let me read one more text to you. It's found over in the book of Colossians. It says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by Him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created, what? By him and for him. It says that the Lord Jesus Christ created everything. He made it. Now, with that understanding, let's put something together. Because it says, Genesis 2, verse 3, Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he, what? rested from all his creation, his work, which God had created and made. Now, that word, God, there is referring to God the Son. It's referring to God the Son. And when it says, then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, who's the one that created to begin with? Jesus Christ. He was the one that made everything. It says that he rested that he blessed the Sabbath day, that he hallowed it. It was Jesus Christ, the Son, that had made this world. It had come from his hand, okay? Now, I'm trying to help you understand a relationship with Jesus Christ because it says here, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and what? forever. Now, if it was Jesus Christ that made the world, and that's what the Scripture says, it came from his hand. He is the one that created in the beginning, and it says that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Then when you come to a text like this that says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now, listen to verse 11 very carefully. For in six days the what? All right, let's read that like the Scripture teaches it. For in six days the Lord Jesus Christ made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord Jesus Christ blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Therefore, what I'm trying to tell you tonight, it was Jesus Christ that gave the Sabbath in the beginning, and the Scripture says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's what it says. He's the one that made it. He's the one that gave it to start with. It came from his hand. Now, some people say, but Brother Cox, it wasn't kept. I hear people say, you know, Sure, it was there at creation, but it wasn't kept. Do you remember the children of Israel? You remember they were over in Egypt? And you remember they've been led out of Egypt by Moses. They've crossed the Red Sea, and they've got out in the wilderness, and uh, they run out of something to eat. And they went to Moses, and they said, Moses, uh, we don't have anything to eat. And Moses prayed, and God gave them what? manna. Now, he gave them some instructions about that manna. He told them they could go out and they could gather as much manna as they could eat that day. 
He told them, gather only as much as you can eat because if you gather more and you try to keep it overnight, it'll spoil. It'll breed worms and it'll stink. That's what he told them. And that morning when they woke up and this stuff was laying all over the ground, man, they went out and they gathered it up by the bushel basketfuls. And that night it stank up the whole camp, you know. Strange, they won't listen. And God said, I told you, gather only as much as you can eat. But when the sixth day came around, he said, go out and gather twice as much. Listen. Then Moses said, eat that today, for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, there will be none. They gathered twice as much on the sixth day. It didn't spoil that night and they ate it on the Sabbath. Dear friends, they haven't arrived at Mount Sinai yet. They haven't gotten there. And those children of Israel aren't saying, well, what's the Sabbath? They know what the Sabbath is. They arrive at Mount Sinai. Moses goes up into the mountain. There he's going to commune with God. And on tables of stone, God writes with his own finger those Ten Commandments. We usually don't have any trouble with the Ten Commandments except this fourth one. But that fourth one, he said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. It's strange that the Lord would say, remember? You think he had maybe an idea that people might forget? For in six days... The Lord made heaven and earth and sea and all that is in them and rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Now, dear friends, you can go through the Old Testament and you won't find any place where God changed the Sabbath. In fact, the Lord takes the question of the Sabbath and projects it right into the new earth because this is what it says in the book of Isaiah. He said, For as a new heavens and new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed, your descendants, and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. It even says that on the new earth that God's people are going to keep the Sabbath. You see, God's law isn't changed. That is the very heart of his government. It will be that for eternity. But some people would say, but maybe Jesus changed it. Maybe Jesus changed the Sabbath. Well, let's see how Christ related to this question of the Sabbath. If we go to the book of Luke, Luke the fourth chapter, verse 16, and it says, and he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. Now, let me ask you something. Is a custom something you do one time? No, a custom is something you do over and over. It says that it was Christ's custom to go to the synagogue on the Sabbath. That is still a custom there today, dear friends. When I go over to Israel, boy, I can tell you, come Friday evening, and by the way, the Sabbath starts at sunset on Friday. That's what the Scripture says. Boy, you can see all the Jewish people headed for the synagogue. Welcome in the Sabbath. That was Christ's custom. He went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. Went there for the purpose of worshiping. But some people want to say to me, they say, oh, Brother Cox, uh, he did away with all that. When Jesus died on the cross, he did away with all that. In fact, I have people tell me, oh, he nailed all the law to the cross and that's all been done away with. We're not under an old covenant. We're under grace. We're not under law. I buy that 101%. We are not under law. We're under grace. We're not saved by law. We're saved by grace. We're not under an old covenant. We're under a new covenant. But give me another word for covenant. Come on. Yes, promise, agreement, commandment, Contract, those are words for a covenant. Let's say that you and I enter into a covenant, a contract. 
and we sat down together and we put down all the stipulations of the contract or the covenant and we write it all out and both of us agree and we both sign it. Now, can that covenant, that contract be changed? Can it be changed? Sure it can. If there's some things about it that you and I don't like, we can sit down and say, we think this ought to be changed and we can have that crossed out and put in new stipulations and sign it. That's perfectly legal and perfectly right. It can be changed. But let's say the two of us sit down and we agree on a contract. We agree on something and we sign it. And then let's say that one of us dies. Can it be changed? No. Therefore, dear friends, what I'm trying to tell you is when the Lord Jesus Christ died on Calvary, it could not be changed. And it was not changed before he died. And don't let anybody tell you he changed it after he died. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It doesn't change. You'll find that Jesus, he gave the Sabbath. He was the one that created the world. He's the one that rested. He's the one that blessed it. He's the one that hallowed it, and when he gave it, dear friends, it can't be changed after he died. Impossible. Can't take place. And you find Christ relating perfectly to that because when he talked about the destruction of Jerusalem, he talked about this. Let me also show you that it didn't change when he died. It says, this man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. That's Joseph of Arimathea. He went to Pilate, asked for the body of Jesus, took it down, wrapped it in linen, laid it in a tomb that was hewn out of the rock where no one had ever lain before. That day was the preparation and the Sabbath drew near. So it says that Jesus died on the preparation the day before the Sabbath. All right? And the women who came with him from Galilee followed after they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. And they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils and rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. Now, these women that had followed Jesus for three and a half years, Christ is dead, but it says that they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. They didn't know about any change. In fact, as Jesus talked about the destruction of Jerusalem, he said, but you pray that your flight not be in the winter or on the Sabbath. You know when the destruction of Jerusalem took place? 70 A.D. That happens to be 39 years after the death of Jesus. Told him, pray that your flight would not take place in the winter because it would be hard on him, or on the Sabbath because the gates would be locked. Said, pray that it doesn't take place then. You don't find Jesus making any change at all, but some people say, well, maybe the disciples changed it. Maybe the apostles changed it. Well, we don't have time tonight to go through all the apostles, so we're going to take a look at just one of them. We're going to take a look at Paul, and we're going to see how Paul related to this question of the Sabbath. Did he talk about any kind of a change? Well, let's go to the book of Acts, see what it says about Paul and the Sabbath. And when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next. Who begged? Gentiles, not Jews. They've gone to Paul and they said, listen, preach to us the next Sabbath. Now, if there had been a change, Paul could have said, no, I'll preach to you tomorrow. That isn't what he said to them. Now, when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. Listen carefully now. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. When did they come? Next Sabbath, Paul preached to them. They came, the Gentiles came and said, listen, preach to us on the Sabbath. And the next Sabbath, almost the whole city turned out and he preached to them on the next Sabbath. Some people say, Brother Cox, the reason he did that was because there's a Jewish synagogue there. 
Well, let's take a look if Paul's in a place where there's not a Jewish synagogue. You see, the Jews have all settled along Asia Minor. You remember Paul had a vision about a man over in Macedonia? That's over in Europe. And they go over into Macedonia. Jews haven't migrated much into that part of the country yet. Therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course to Sample Thrace, and the next day to Neapolis. All right, now, they've caught a ship, and they've sailed over to Macedonia. They're going up to the city of Philippi. And from there to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia, and a colony, and we were staying in the city for some, what? Days. They're there for a number of days. The Sabbath comes. Let's see how they relate to the Sabbath. And on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made, and we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. They got there to Philippi. <clears throat> There's no Jewish synagogue there. They hear about these women that are having prayer out by the river. And so they go out there and they worship with them. This is where Lydia was converted. So you find Paul keeping the Sabbath even when there wasn't a Jewish synagogue around. In fact, it says this about Paul. And Paul, as his custom was, went into them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scripture. It says it was Paul's what? Custom, something he did over and over. He went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, just the same as Jesus did, because Paul was a follower of Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Therefore, Paul kept the Sabbath. Some people say, but maybe... Time's been lost. Maybe we don't know which day's which day. Maybe that's been lost. Oh, that might have been a good idea or objection 20, 25 years ago, but not in this day and age. Not in this age when we send people off to the moon and rockets off and all that. You see, these scientists are very much concerned about time and they will tell you time has not been lost. An astronomer can set down with the telescope, and if you destroyed every method that we had of telling time, you got rid of the clocks, the calendars, and everything, he can set down with the telescope, and in two hours and 15 minutes, he can tell you the day, he can tell you the month, he can tell you the year. Time has not been lost. In fact, we had a comet here just not too long ago called Halley's Comet. Makes a huge orbit in the heavens. People only see it once in a lifetime. You saw it. Probably next generation may see it. Probably, hopefully, from the new earth. But anyhow, they only see it once in a lifetime. They have dug up sightings of Halley's Comet or Halley's Comet, however you say it, as far back as 1500 B.C. Now, if time had been lost since 1500 B.C. and today, then the dates won't coincide, but they do perfectly. Time has not been lost. We don't have to worry about that. But there are some people that would say, well... Yes, but uh, how do we know for sure? You see, I don't think you have to go back any farther than Jesus. We read this text. It says, this man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus, took it down, wrapped it in linen, laid it in a tomb that was hewn out of a rock where no one had ever lain before. That day was the preparation and the Sabbath drew near. Now, that day, the preparation, that's the day before the Sabbath, we call that day what? We call it Good Friday. That's the day Jesus died. Put it down. All right, let's go on. The women who came with him from Galilee followed after. They observed the tomb and how his body was laid. 
They returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils and rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. So it says the next day after Good Friday was the Sabbath. Let's continue. We're reading what, what Luke says here. Luke, the 24th chapter, verse 1, Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared, and they found Jesus had already risen from the grave, and we call that day what? Easter Sunday, first day of the week. Now, do I have any trouble knowing when the Sabbath is? No, the Sabbath just comes between Good Friday and Easter Sunday. I mean, you don't have any trouble knowing which day is the Sabbath. And if Jesus said, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy, and Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, you see, then I should follow what he says. Simply what it's saying. But people say, well, which day is the seventh day of the week? I have some people say, well, we don't know which day is the seventh day of the week. Oh, yes, we do. We don't have to have any doubts as to which day is the seventh day of the week. You see, the Jewish people, when I go over to Israel, the calendar that hangs on the wall of an Orthodox Jewish home is the same calendar that existed in the days of Jesus. And they know exactly which day is the Sabbath. But language... Language itself tells us. We don't have to have any doubts about that. For instance, the Spanish people, they call Saturday what? They call it Sabado. It means Sabbath. That's what the word Saturday in their language is. German people, let me ask you. Maybe somebody here speaks German. Tell me what the word in German for Wednesday is. Metvo, that's right. That means middle of the week. Let me see you get any other day other than Saturday be the last day of the week, the seventh day of the week, if Wednesday's the middle. Won't work. We don't have to have any doubts at all, friends. We know clearly which day is the Sabbath. There's plenty of evidence for that. Well, you're probably asking the question, what does all this have to do with Adam's mother's birthday. Well, I'm going to tell you what it has to do with Adam's mother's birthday. I told you I would tell you who Adam's mother was, and this is who Adam's mother was. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. You see, Adam's mother was Mother Earth. That's who Adam's mother was, was Mother Earth. God formed Adam from the dust of the ground. Now you say, well, how does that have to do with Adam's mother and what does that have to do with the Sabbath? Listen carefully because this is what it says in Psalms. Speaking of Christ, he has made his wonderful works to be what? Oh, Jesus said, listen, I created all these wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. If he created and to be remembered, let's see if he told you how to remember it. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Listen to the point. For in six days the Lord did what? Made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rest of the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. You see, Jesus Christ said, I created all this and I want you to remember it. And he said, every seventh day, I want you to remember that I created this earth. That's what he's telling you. He set that day aside, made it special. Well, you say, but Brother Cox, what difference does it make? Does it make any difference? I believe it does. I believe it does for several reasons. And I'll tell you what those reasons are. To begin with, it tells me that Jesus Christ, my Lord, my Savior, it tells me that he did certain things concerning the Sabbath. One, it tells me that he blessed the Sabbath day. Now, 
We got a cake over here. Uh, I could bless that cake. Do you think it would change it? Huh? No. My blessing that cake's not going to change it one bit. But you think if the Lord blesses it, it does something to it? You better believe it does. It says that he took the seventh day and he blessed it. That makes that day different than any other day of the week. It not only says that he blessed the seventh day, it also says that he hallowed it. That word hallowed means made holy. Do you know what makes something holy? Huh? Well, let me give you an illustration. Remember when Moses was up there on the mountain and this bush was burning? And he got close to it and the Lord said, Moses, take off your shoes for the ground you're standing on is holy. What made that ground holy? Presence of God. That's what makes the Sabbath holy. It's the presence of God. You see, he's there. He's taken that seventh day and he said, listen, I've blessed it. I've hallowed it. That makes it different than any other day of the week. It's not like any other day of the week. And then it also says that the Lord Jesus Christ sanctified it. That word sanctified means set apart. That's what it means. It means that the Lord took that seventh day and he set it apart and he said, I blessed it, I hallowed it, I sanctified it, I set it apart for a special time for you and me. That's what he's saying. And what you do, dear friends, when you ignore the Sabbath and you say, no, I'm not going to do that, what you're really doing is ignoring an appointment that the Lord made with you. Because he set that day aside as a special time to spend with his people. Because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It says, and it shall come to pass, that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh shall come to worship before me, saith the Lord. It's going to be kept in eternity, be kept all the way down through time. You see, the Lord simply see if I can do this. Took that first day, and it says that He created the light and the darkness. And on the second day, he divided the firmament. And on the third day, he created the sun and the moon and the stars. And on the fourth day, he created the grass and the trees and the herbs. And on the fifth day, he created the fish and the fowls. And on the sixth day, he created the animals and man. But when he came down here to this day, seventh day, it says that he took that day and that he blessed it, he hallowed it, he sanctified it. He made that day different than any other day of the week. Set it aside. It's a special day that God has set aside to spin with you and I. Now, don't misunderstand me. I believe that you and I are to worship the Lord and serve the Lord every day, seven days a week. But boy, when I come to the Sabbath, the Scripture tells me I get a double blessing. I mean, that day is special because the Lord has taken that day and he's blessed it and he's hallowed it and he's sanctified it and it is quality time that the Lord spends with me. That makes the Sabbath a special time of rejoicing, a special time of worship as God meets with us each Sabbath. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for Jesus, thankful for his love, Thankful, Lord, that he's willing 
to spend time with us, that we can come and worship Him and know that He set aside a special time just to communicate with each of us. Bless each one here tonight that they may experience the joy, the happiness, the peace, the close communion that there comes in keeping the Sabbath. For this we ask, in Christ's name, amen. Let me make just a couple announcements. One, tomorrow night. Tomorrow night our subject is 3,000 years to accomplish a cover-up. We're going to talk about something that makes Watergate look like child's play. We're going to talk about something that a lot of things that you just have gone through life and you don't even know where they came from, but were covered up and handed to us. And you don't want to miss tomorrow night. It's a very, very important subject. Tomorrow night is. Also, uh, I'm just not sure that I can say the name right. Help me, Donna. I'm about forgotten. Muncie? M U N. C-I-E, if there's a person by that last name here in the audience, we need to see you. Uh, Muncie or something like that. M-U-N-I-C-E, I think is the way it's spelled. If you're here, we'd like to see you at the close of the service. Also, we would remind you that out in the lobby here, right in the front of it, of us, the uh, folks that sing and all have some records and tapes there. If you're enjoying the music, you might like to take a few moments to browse and take a look at what they have there. I think you'll find it to be a special treat to you. So we hope that you'll take that opportunity. We'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow night. Good night. And God bless each one of you.